I picked up another truck like I needed it. 6.5 diesel, turbo diesel, it's a 95, it's an electronic one, um, with an NV4500. So this truck was loved early in its life, or for most of its life, um, and then it just kind of got backburnered there for a while. Uh, PMD was already relocated, that's going to be very, very standard pretty much on all of these trucks anymore. I doubt there's many left that have still have the PMD under the intake like they were when they were, were new. Um, but what we're going to start with on this, I'm going to make this a little bit more of an industrial type truck instead of, you know, you know, it was obviously done up real, so it was real nice. Um, we're going to make it nice, but we're going to make it more of an industrial truck. But the very first thing and what this episode is focusing on, we are going to make this thing reliable. Um, these 6.265 diesels are known for being basically made of Achilles heels. So we're going to fix as many of those as possible, and this should be a pretty good reliable truck that also gets pretty good gas mileage. So I got the first round of degreasing and pressure washing done, and it's looking quite a bit better. Let's see if I can get the sun. There we go. It's looking quite a bit better, but we still have more to do. But if you can tell, it looks way more clean in there, and like, what did I do to make that thing look so clean? Check that freaking crap out. So I don't think there's a single mechanic out there that likes that stuff, especially when it's all brittle and falling apart like that. So all I did was unbolt all the little accessories, you know, the water tank, um, take the wiring harness off. There's a, a few clips. There's a couple of screws that I just put back in that hold it on or are supposed to be holding it on. Um, and then just kind of yank it out and break it up. Um, I am one of those guys who much prefers a nice clean firewall. And if I want insulation, I'll take the carpet out and put some dynamite on the firewall um, from the inside, not from the outside. So that looks a lot better. That was not usable stuff anyway, so that was all pretty rough. And it's also mouse nest material, so the more of that I can get out, the better. Okay, so a little bit of time has passed um, since that last video, or, or since the last video where I was cleaning up the truck. And it, it went through winter, and now we're getting close to spring. We're still a little bit of snow on the ground yet. Um, and you can see the wheels and tires were changed, and that was because I had those wheels on a truck that I was selling. And I, I like them. They're the 2000 Chevy truck wheels. They're really strong, and they're already powder-coated black. And then I just wrapped them in some Thunderer tires, which are a fairly inexpensive tire that I've had really good luck with. Um, and uh, there, there'll be links to in the description below for all that stuff. So anyway, those are pretty good tires. Um, of course, over the winter, I moved the truck a couple times and the door handles broke. <laughs> so the door panel is off. We're going to replace that here in a little while in the video as well. Um, but I'm setting up a tool tray to get us pretty close to having everything we need right in front of the truck. And we're going to start with replacing the vacuum pump with nothing. We're going to replace it with air. Um, so we're going to, the only thing the vacuum pump on this truck controls is the wastegate on the turbo. We're going to put a mechanical wastegate control in, which will allow us to increase the boost. And then it'll go along with our e-torque chip that we're going to be putting in later in the video as well. So to get it off, it's fairly easy. It's self-explanatory. You can't really see what I'm doing, but uh, it's, it's just a few bolts. You get it out. But once you get it out, you do need to take the bracket off of it and put the bracket back because the AC compressor does need that bracket back. Um, and then there will be a link in the description below for the proper belt for running it without the AC or without the uh, vacuum pump there. Um, we'll get into fixing that up the rest of the way here in a bit, but while the belt is off, I am going to replace our harmonic balancer with a fluid damper. I'm gonna do all that without taking the fan or the shroud off just by drilling a hole in the front side of the shroud and then using a wobble um, on an impact gun to get it out. It's a little bit hard to get the balancer pulled with the shroud and the fan there, but it's not impossible and it's not hard enough to justify taking the fan and the shroud off uh, to get to it. Um, then when you go to install the new one, um, there's, a, there's a few tricks to do as well. This is aviation non-hardening sealer and that's gonna actually help drive that thing on. All right, this is not ideal. I put a thinner washer in just so we had more thread engagement. That's as far on as I could get it just by uh, tapping on it with my little copper hammer. Um, and I don't have a driver, I don't have an installer for this, which is like a large metric. I didn't even measure what side it was because I know I don't have a driver for it. Um, so anyway, I did a thin washer and then just drove the nut or the bolt in. And then we're going to slowly turn it. We want to make sure we don't strip the crank out. Um, this should hopefully work, but we just have to be really, really careful and uh, pay attention. It So 
So this washer will eventually start squishing once you get this thing all the way installed. It should just, it should just all of a sudden bottom out. So our washer got a little cupped, but that's okay. Okay, I put some blue Loctite on. Some guys will say red. I can already hear the comment section blowing up about my blue Loctite. Um, and that's okay. If you'd rather use red, then go ahead and use red. But uh, I have actually had cranks. These are cast cranks, and I've actually had them strip out the bolt because of red Loctite. And, you know, it's not always that you want to use a bunch of heat on a crankshaft so you can break red Loctite loose. All right, and there's a link in the description below for the right belt for the running it without the vacuum pump. And uh, the rest of the vacuum circuit, you can just remove it. I just rip it all out of there. There's just some plastic lines that are going to break into a million pieces if they're not broken already. Um, and then there's a little solenoid. And I removed the solenoid on this one. I haven't had a check engine light or anything from it. So um, I don't know. I, some people have said that you get uh, check engine lights from that. But I haven't yet, and it's um, obviously I'm doing recording this and voiceovering it after the fact, and it hasn't been an issue. So now we're putting our manual or our mechanical wastegate controller on there. Um, this is a Heath Diesel part, and uh, it seems to work pretty good. They, it's easy to install. Again, it's kind of hard to see. The hardest part about it is getting the clip off and then getting your fingers behind it to put the nuts and stuff on on the the arm on the turbo itself or on the wastegate itself um, and then for adjusting it um, they give you some rough diet you know how much to pre-compress the spring for a rough guesstimation on how much boost it's going to create I and mean, then obviously you're going to have to tune that once you get the truck running again and adjust it from there all right so now that that's all done um, we're going to do go on to the next achilles heel of these motors and that's the uh oil cooler lines. Um, that's probably the number one failure of these engines is blowing an oil cooler line and then uh, seizing the motor up, spinning a bearing or whatever. Obviously I have some oil leaks. Um, they say to remove the drive line or to disconnect the drive line to get this out. I don't know if that was actually necessary, but uh, anyway, you need to get that housing out and then we'll move on to the lines. Okay, so we have to take our grill out. We are gonna change our headlights, marker lights and all that stuff anyway, but we also need to change our oil cooler. So just take all the screws out that you can see they're in there. This one was broke. I think someone didn't know that these screws were there at one point <laughs> and uh, ripped on the on the hood. Um, and then you take the four screws out of these markers and then right here, it's kind of just looks like a shape, but you actually lift that and that's uh, how your thing unlatches. And then we'll do the same on this side. I already got the screws out, obviously. Lift that and then the grill comes out. And then in the center, there's one right in here okay you can see it down there right in the middle you just have to you just have to push it down just sticking your finger through and just push it down it's not hard but now we'll take our lights out the light bulbs out which obviously pretty standard and then the grill will pop out and then uh, we'll get our oil cooler changed and then we'll swap our headlights out and stuff in a little bit all right, so once you get the grill and everything out uh, taking the lines out is easy as long as you don't care about ruining them getting them out without ruining them is somewhat challenging so i just recommend cutting them um, and then just bending them up and wadding them up to get them out they're not held in crazy well so it's not super hard to get them out so on that full disclosure i'm not super happy with this with this oil cooler kit the lines they're they're basically a hydraulic line and in my personal opinion they made them a little bit too short you have to they, they run basically perfectly straight once you once you bend down or underneath the oil cooler and go straight back they run perfectly straight but man they're like they don't really give you if it was a half an inch shorter you wouldn't even be able to get it it would be like a piano wire um so i'm not 100 percent sure why they make them so short um they should they should add in one inch to whatever they're making them at just so you have a little bit of cushion on it i, I don't like having them having them quite that uh quite that tight so later on i'm probably going to replace those all with an style push lock um, lines and and eliminate eliminate those hydraulic lines there's 
max pressure in those lines is going to be 60 or so. Um, they're not going to be a lot. So this is the factory oil filter housing. I cleaned it up and we're replacing all the O-rings that are included with the oil cooler, um, which is good because I needed them because that thing was leaking like a, like crazy. So um, so so that's going to be nice having that having that. Uh, all sealed up a little bit better. Um, now, when you install this thing again, it is, uh, you, you have to have it indexed just right or you'll tighten it up, but it won't actually seal. Uh, so you, you will puke all your oil out uh, when you go to start it. Hopefully it won't start right up um, when, when that happens because it will really, really pour out of there. I, I did that on this one on accident um, and, it, and it did that. So now we're gonna install our AirDog fuel system. And on this one, it's really hard to see what I'm doing. So I just, I'm going backwards and I'm just going to show you how I did everything and show you how it all hooks up because it's really self-explanatory somewhat. It just might be a little overwhelming. So here's how I installed it. It goes really, really smoothly. Okay, so you have to do a return line and uh, this is how they, they have you do it. So you just actually cut your filler neck line and install the piece that's provided in between with the hose clamps. Um, very easy, simple to do. Um, it just seems a little overwhelming when you're looking at it on the table, but really easy to do. And then it just has a push lock style barb sitting on it. Mounting it is simple as well. It just sandwiches the frame. And if you do it on the driver's side, the rearward fuel fitting is your inlet. And on the other side, you have your return, which is closest to you. And on the farther side is your pressure line. So that's now your lift pump line. You cut the factory fuel line and it's a compression style fitting there. So just use a little pipe cutter, cut it, deburr it, slip it on there, tighten it up and you're good to go. Then you just have a little line there going to your inlet side. And then on the outlet side, the black line obviously is running to the filler neck. And on the outlet side, you're going to remove your factory lift pump, which is for Memorial style lift pump on these, which was right there where the hose is running through that black clamp. You had a power wire that's right there. You're gonna unplug that, take that lift pump out, cut it, cut the line on the other side of it, and install the other compression fitting right there. Okay, so on the engine compartment side, you got your wiring. I shortened all my wiring. Um, that is that was my choice, but you do have risk of voiding warranties and all that fun stuff if, if that were to happen, if they were to find out that you shortened wiring. Um, Obviously, uh, if, if you do something and screw up or make a mistake uh, and you cause damage to it, they don't want to warranty that. So um, they're going to be picky on that. But this is their connector, and this just replaces one of your mini fuses. And uh, you install the mini fuse you take out in the bottom, and then the top fuse is now the fuse. This is just the fuse powering the relay. It's not the fuse that powers the pump. It's just, just for the relay, so it's just a little two amper. Um, I chose this circuit there, which is actually the... Uh, fuel solenoid it says which is the solenoid on the on the engine itself so basically if the fuel solenoids open there um, then our fuel system is running so I, I felt that was a good one uh, that was a good one to do so um, that works pretty good um, for power powering the whole system I just chose it off the inlet power going into our breaker panel there um, you can see the power line there with a the red boot on it going in then the blue line going out, that is a that is actually a fusible link going to your glow plugs. And that should be the only thing hooked on there now unless something, someone added to it. Um, and so that's where I chose to put the power going in to our air dog system. And then this is now the fuse for your air dog system. That comes with it as well. So I cleaned it up, mounted it to the firewall. I made a ground post there. I wouldn't use a sheet metal screw and just use sheet metal screw. I actually do a thread insert. Um, I clean it real well, put a stainless steel thread insert in, and then, uh, and, and then that's my new ground stud. This may not work for your situation if you don't have those. If you don't, you're actually going to want to go to a good ground stud somewhere else um, or just go to the battery itself. Um, I think they, they suggest hooking it to the alternator in the directions. But um, anyway, that's how I did mine, and uh, that, that works very, very well. Onto the fuel system. The fuel system, I took out my fuel filter. I can already hear my comment section blowing up about that. And while I have, you have to make an adapter basically to go from three eighths to quarter um, because it's only quarter inch line going into the injection pump itself. Um, so while I was doing that, I just added a port for a, a gauge. That is not necessary, but it is kind of nice knowing what your inlet fuel pressure is. So you can make any adjustments that is adjustable on the air dog itself. And then it just runs up 
and goes straight to the injection pump. And then I used the factory water drain valve for basically a service port. And what that does now is I can, if I change my fuel filter, I can actually cycle some fluid through, some diesel through, just pouring that into a container. Um, that way, if we get dirt or something accidentally in our system while changing our filters, we can cycle it out before hopefully it ends up in our injection pump. So that's what I did with that. Uh, and otherwise, it's a, it's a very simple, straightforward install. You could not do any of what I just did up there and leave your factory fuel filter. That would be fine. You can do that. That is completely up to you. Um, and if you choose to do that, then fine. You don't have to do basically any of the fuel system on the top side if you don't want to. You can just leave all the factory stuff intact. All right, and so now that we have more boost, we have a fuel system and all that fun stuff. Now we need a chip to go along with it. So this is an e-torque chip. Um, I believe this is a Heath diesel. Um, there'll be a link in the description below for it anyway. Um, Heath diesel used to be local to us and, and I don't know if they moved or if they got bought out, but they're in Florida now. Um, but anyway, that's real simple. Just swap out the chip and put it in and then you're, they want you to uh, turn the ignition on there's some, there's some stuff, read the directions on, on whoever you get your chip from, but uh, they want you to leave the ignition on and stuff without it running. And then you're going to, once, once you go through that cycle, then they're going to have you run it and get it up to basically operating temp for a certain amount of time. Um, and that's really all there is to the chip, but uh, it's been a while since I put a chip in something. Um, that's definitely an old school thing. So now I'm just changing out the headlights and the marker lights and, the, and all that fun stuff on the grill. Um, very, very easy project, but man, it makes a big difference on the look of these things. Just getting, uh, getting those yellow and faded lights off of there. And while you're at it, it's always a good idea to change your bulbs now. Not that these bulbs are particularly hard to change once it's all together, but uh, you may as well make sure they're all working. I did actually have a problem with my little corner bulbs, the 194 bulbs in the corner. They weren't actually... Uh, I couldn't get them to make contact, so I had to, I had to bend my, my connectors a little bit to uh, get them to work. And then I packed electrical grease in all of it, all the fittings so that uh, hopefully everything will stay nice and not get corroded and all that fun stuff. So now we're going to change the rear tailgate latch handle on it. And uh, this is just a you know, cheapo one that I got from, from uh, AutoZone. And it uh, worked for about a day in, in all this clarity. Um, and then I had some boards resting on the tailgate and uh, I tried to force it open and I bent it. So um, you gotta be careful with them, I guess. Uh, the, the quality of them isn't, isn't the greatest. Um, now I'm gonna change the taillights out. Uh, those taillights are really, really dated. So I'm changing them out with just some black tinted taillights uh, on Amazon. Again, link in the description below changing out the bulbs and all that fun stuff. This is a really easy project. You don't really need too much tutorial on that um, just to change these these uh, taillights out on these trucks. All the new trucks have really easy taillights to change, I have to say. But uh, those look pretty good. I, I'm pretty happy with those. All right, and so now I'm going to duct tape up my seats <laughs> because um, until I can find some better seats or, or figure out what I'm going to do with seats, I just bought some custom seat covers for intended for these seats. They're actually... Uh, the, only, the only way I could find them that would work with this style seat was for a Tahoe. And the only problem with that is it's missing the lever for the, uh, for the rear entry. It's missing the hole for that. So um, that, that lever now is underneath the seat cover. Otherwise, they're, they're pretty good. They don't, they're not the best looking seat covers in the world, but uh, they're not too bad. Um, so now we're going to do our boost gauge, which I had a, one of those boost bolts <laughs> that were for these. I've actually had that for a long time. Um, and then uh, we're going to do the EGT gauge. And so for the EGT gauge, there's a spot in the manifold that actually works out really well. If you take, if you take your breather off, um, you can see there's like a little lug there, uh, like a thick spot in the manifold that's flat. Um, it's a really good spot to drill and tap for your EGT gauge. And uh, the drill and tap come with the gauge. So these are the glow shift gauges and it actually comes with the drill and tap. So you don't have to do any guessing. Um, but my advice for that is when you're doing the tapping with the, it's a pipe tap, go about halfway and then check the fit of the fitting and make sure it's gonna tighten up right. Um, normally uh, you would go about three quarters down a pipe tap and that would be about the perfect perfect depth for a, a pipe fitting to fit in. Um, but I always, start uh, at about half, double check that you do need to go that additional quarter or adjust 
from there. But uh, that it's a pretty easy project and that's pretty good. Um, and then just remember just to vacuum out um, as much, much of the chips as you can. Um, a, a little bit of them is not gonna really hurt the turbo and that's cast iron so it doesn't make big chips, it just kind of makes dust. So um, it, it should just flow through the turbo fine. But I always vacuum out as much of it as I possibly can. Another trick would be to put grease on the drill and on the tap and, that, and then just keep cleaning it. Uh, and then all the chips for the most part stick to the to the uh, to the drill and the tap. So now we're gonna put in our pods and my only advice on that is mark out where you want it with a Sharpie. And then uh, just as you're drilling, put the drill one hole, put put the little Christmas tree thing in, um, do the next hole and, and then just kind of move on. Don't try to drill multiple holes or they probably won't line up. So Akila upholstered my steering wheel. We didn't really know what we were doing here. So we didn't do a great job of filming it, but it ended up turning out really good. Um, so that steering wheel, there's a link in the description below, but it's, it's a kit for that steering wheel. And it actually worked really well, but there's quite a bit of a learning curve to that. So um, we're thinking about getting another one and doing another steering wheel so that we can show everything we've learned by doing it um, on there. Cause it, it really wasn't that hard but but you definitely scratch your head a little bit now we're doing a straight pipe exhaust system um, so i'm removing the entire exhaust system and we're going to do a straight pipe system that i got there's a link for this one below this isn't the best system in the world but it was 240 dollars shipped to my door so um, i'm not going to complain about some fitment issues uh, because for the most part it fit all right it does help to remove your inner fender on your passenger side uh, just take out every single bolt and you should be able to get it out um, and then just you'll just have to put it in and put everything back. Some some of the things you'll have to move to line up again. So you can see there that uh, the fitting uh, is really, really loose on that one. And it's funny, this this kit had a one review and it was that the fitting was really loose. Um, and it's just this one uh, that's loose like that. So I just am using my hydraulic expander that we made, uh, link popping up somewhere in the video. And there'll also be a link down in the description below uh, for how I made that thing. But uh, that thing works pretty good and it, and it was able to expand it out so we had a nice tight fit there and the clamp will do uh, a lot better of a job that way. So one thing when you're doing these band style clamps, which I actually haven't installed yet, but they're, the, uh, they're a nice sealing clamp and they work really, really good, but I don't like them for putting entire exhaust systems. So this is just a hanger clamp um, that, I, that I'm messing with there. But uh, I don't like them, but I will mock up the whole system and I'll take those off. I'll tack the tack the pipes and then just put those clamps right back over top of them. Um, and that works out pretty good, but that keeps the system from, from kind of arranging itself as you're driving around and hitting bumps and stuff. So now if you're gonna buy the cheaper kit like I bought, um, be prepared to have to modify it a little bit. It's not a perfect fitting kit, um, but it's, it's not terrible and it's cheaper than buying bins and making the kit yourself. Um, so it, it's, it's a pretty good kit, but the, some of the, some of the angles weren't quite right. And I had to kind of cheat on them a little bit. Um, but that's not that big of a deal because like I said, we're going to remove all the clamps and I just weld it anyway. Um, and I don't weld the whole thing. You could just weld the whole thing if you wanted and not use the clamps at all. Um, or you can just tack them and that's just to keep the pipe from spinning in the, in the clamp. Cause that style clamp, like I said, they, they seal real well, but they don't. Um, necessarily hold real well as far if you were to like hit that on a rock or or kick it or even just vibrations and stuff it doesn't really hold it from from moving guys so that that wraps it up sorry there wasn't like really cool driving shots the weather's not very good um but we hit the achilles heels the main ones are the balancer 
and the uh, oil cooler lines. Those are, I call those the main Achilles heels because those will just catastrophically kill the motor. Um, I have never lost a balancer and not had to take out the crank. I know people who have, but I also have never had an oil cooler line blow, but I also replace them um, when they start getting CP. And usually they have to be CP for a while before they'll actually blow out. Um, but if they're older, change them because those things can just rupture or pop off. And it's, these only have a, like a seven quart capacity. So it, takes seconds <laughs> and they're out of oil um and if you're on the freeway or something it's going to be done before you get pulled over to the side of the road um so those are the main the ones um the other catastrophic failure could be starter on the block i've never had that happen i have broke bolts though but i found if you run the mini starters um there'll be a link in the description below but the mini starter has so much more power that it spins the motor smoother so you don't get that, which is like hammering the block. Um, so the mini starters, I think, are a must, um, and that we should eliminate that. This one has it already. I changed it because the starter failed um, after I very first got it, and I had to throw it in as a repair, so I didn't have time to video it. Um, but anyway, there's a link in the description below. That's just changing a starter. It's, there's nothing special about it. Um, and, and the starter's lighter than the factory one, so that's a bonus. So. That's the main Achilles heel, um, catastrophically. And then you have the ones that are just annoying reliability ones, like the PDM being relocated. All of them are going to be relocated at this point. I highly recommend, I highly doubt you'll find one of these that doesn't already have one of those relocated. Um, it, if, it, if it hasn't been, the, the PDM is underneath the intake. But uh, pretty much all of them will still have a PDM under there, but the connector won't be to it, and it'll have the extension cable and running another one. It's not my favorite place in the world, by the way, to put them on the intake. I would much rather see them not attached to the engine um, somewhere where it can be even cooler, but um, on the intake is like that one is still better um, than being under the intake. Future projects coming up. Oh, the, the vacuum pumps are another one that, that one's usually just an annoyance thing because they go out and you have to change them, and then it's just, you're basically limping at home because you don't have any boost uh, because the wastegate's controlled by it. Um, I've heard of them taking out the belt with them, um, and that would be a side of the road thing um, that you can't get home with. So that could be annoying. Um, and then the manual wastegate thing is is cool, um, and it's much better and it's more reliable. So I like that, um, and it allows you to get more boost um, and allows for that e-chip. Um, and it allows for it to make a ton of torque at really light throttle and run really efficiently at really, really light throttle. So I'm really hoping that driving this on my 600 mile round trip trips when I'm doing part runs and stuff um, will allow me to get be in the 20s. Um, and we're going to see how high we can get in that. So it's just going to have to take some self-control for me not romping on it and stuff because you can make that 20 go down into the teens really, really quickly um, by just being impatient or trying to race it around, which these are not race car. You're not going to be winning races with these, but the way it's at now, you can actually tow a trailer with it and stuff, and, that, and it has power. So um, it's pretty good. So that's, that's uh, a good one. So future projects coming up. Um, this one's... Well, we'll start with this. We're going to be doing an intercooler on it, um, and that will be coming up real soon. I have everything coming for it. Most of it's here. I'm just waiting on a couple more things, and then I'm going to do the intercooler swap. That should be something that most people can do. It's going to be very, very minimal fab, and I'm hoping the only fab work is just going to be some brackets and stuff that can be done just like taking flat bar and bending it in a vise or something um, like that. So I'm hoping that. Another future project coming up is going to be a snorkel. We're going to build a snorkel for it. we got a I have a bamboo 3D printer. I'm going to make an adapter that we can print out of ABS and I'm going to upload that model once we get it all done so that all you have to do is know someone with a bamboo printer and you'll be able to print that adapter. And then um, it'll just be some, some fairly simple fab work. Or I guess if you really wanted to be cheap, you could just glue, glue together ABS like plumbing pipe, um, which would work. And really, depending on the look of your truck, it might actually kind of look cool. I don't know. Um, I'm going to do mine out of stainless, though. Um, but you can use yours however you want. Um, but anyway, that project will be coming up, too. Another little project we're going to do, and I've done this a few times on my channel already, but uh, Fort 2 Molt Locker. Um, we're going to add a locker to this thing. Um, and what's cool about these full floaters is the carrier on the open diff is the same as the locker. So all you have to do is add the locker. You don't have to reset up your ring and pinion. So it's another thing that you don't have to know how to set up a ring and pinion to add a locker to these. So um, it's a very, very easy project to do on these. It's just stinky because it's gear oil. So um, that'll be coming up. 
And uh, that's about it. So reliability-wise, this thing, I trust it now to drive me my 600-mile round trip. And uh, I don't see any mechanical issues engine-wise that are going to haunt me. Um, and then the wheel bearings and all that stuff on any truck. Um, if you're buying trucks for wheel bearings, um, I hate to tell you, but there's not a truck out there that doesn't have wheel bearings that go out. All these new sealed units, all the new vehicles have them. They only live so long. <laughs> so... If you are going on a lot of road trips, you have a truck that's never had the wheel bearings changed and you're in excess of 150,000 miles, you might want to consider changing those because that, that, that is have your car towed home um, <clears throat> on a flatbed situation because when these wheel bearings go, it's not pretty. <laughs> and then if you do one, do the other because the other one's going to come out and go out right, right afterwards. So um, anyway, that should be it for reliability. The air dog system on this, I don't know if that's 100% necessary um, for re reliability. Um, longevity, yes. Reliability, not really so much. They, they don't really have a problem with the lift pumps and everything on these. That That's not really a known thing that just fails. Um, but having the air dog does help your pump last longer, your injection pump last longer. Um, it's supposed to help you get a little bit better gas mileage by removing air and having a crisper pulse to your injector, um, if that makes sense. Um, there's a lot of, that, that's a lot of marketing stuff. I don't know how much, if you'd actually see the difference, but uh, I run them a lot. I like the filters. I like, all, I like changing those filters a lot more than the intake style filters. So I like them. Um, and, and so I, ch I tend to use them and that's, personal preference for me and for a lot of other guys as well. So um, anyway, that's about it. Thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next one. We got a lot of cool videos coming out, including my Capiz project. That video is just about done or the, the car is just about done. I still need to edit the video. It's a lot of work. We did a full resto on that thing. It's a DZ302 six speed ZF6 manual. Uh, it's a hot, hot, hot car. It's really, really cool just for a street car. Um, and uh, anyway, that video will be coming out real soon. Um, I'm excited to drive that car, but weather is not being nice to me for finishing that build or finishing that, that, uh, video series. So, um, anyway, thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next one.